All right, the book of Galatians again, please, and chapter 5. I'd like to begin reading verse 22. It says, But the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, long suffering, gentleness, goodness, faith, meekness, temperance. Against such there is no law. And they that are Christ have crucified the flesh with the affections and lusts. If we live in the Spirit, let us also walk in the Spirit. Let us not be desirous of vain glory, provoking one another, envying one another. And again, God always blesses the reading of Scripture to us. Uh, what a blessing it is to have Scripture to read. We're very fortunate and very blessed. Uh, I just want to say this, that uh, earlier on Trevor uh, mentioned um, about uh, D.L. Moody. <clears throat> and uh, he was constantly praying <coughs> that he would be filled with the Spirit. And somebody asked him, why does he keep asking to be filled with the Spirit? And his answer was, because I'm leaky, I leak. And of course, sometimes we get that idea that the Holy Spirit, because of the symbols of the Spirit, like oil, uh, that, it's, that the Spirit of God is, is actually some kind of substance, <laughs> but he's a person. And uh, the, the bottom line is that every true believer, uh, as a result of faith in the finished work of Christ, uh, that moment that they trusted in him alone for salvation, they are at that moment indwelt by the Holy Spirit. So every believer has the Holy Spirit living within them. They're a temple now on the day of Pentecost. Uh, when they looked at one another, they saw those flickering flames on their heads, right? Like tongues of fire. And it's really, uh, what, what would Jewish men think of when they saw that? Well, uh, how did you know God was home in the Old Testament? You looked out of your tent in the tabernacle, right? It was a pillar of fire. And that was God was present, right, in the midst. Well, now God has a new temple, right? And so they could see that. I often wonder, I, I've said this many times, but I would love it if the Lord would just switch that on at Sunday morning at 11 o'clock, especially if I was preaching. Because the interesting thing is that the one flame they couldn't see was the one on their own heads, but they could see it on everybody else's. Imagine you're looking out over the congregation and you see a few that have no flame. What would your message become? <laughs> it would become an instant, very personalized gospel message, wouldn't it? Uh, but we believe that true Christians are indwelt by the Spirit of God. But the question is this. Uh, we all have the Spirit, but does He have all of us? In other words, is, are, are our lives yielded fully to His control? And so we, we use this natural man, uh, carnal man, spiritual man. Um, we talked about the fact that when it came to the carnal man, uh, Christ is in his life, but self is still on the throne. And we could say that in the same way, that uh, somebody who is a believer and they're not fully yielded to the control of the Holy Spirit, then who's in control? Well, the flesh is in control and the works of the flesh will be manifest. But if the Holy Spirit is in control of that person's life and they're yielding control to him, walking in dependence on him moment by moment, <coughs> then as a result of that, fruit will be produced. And this fruit, it really, as we've said, it's character, it's Christ-like character that will be seen in that believer's life. And it's set here in Ephesians 5 in, in stark contrast to this polluting factory that we saw, the works of the flesh. And we witnessed all of that. We looked at that last time. Now we want to, on a much more positive note, what does it look like when somebody is fully walking in dependence upon the Holy Spirit and this lovely fruit, singular, uh, but of course it has different manifestations, comes out in the person's life. And we said it's Christ-likeness. It's that, that person becomes like the Lord Jesus. And so the first thing that's mentioned is love. And that's really important, isn't it? Because so much of what we looked at when it came to the flesh was very much self gratification, wasn't it? Especially in the sexual sense, it was all about my gratification. Whereas this love is this sacrificial love. It's not all about self and getting. It's, it's about giving. It's about loving. It's about, about loving with sacrifice. And so that's the picture that he wants 
to uh, give to us here that this love uh, should be seen in our lives. And of course, we could go to 1 Corinthians 13 and, and talk about what does that love look like and uh, all the different aspects of it. Uh, but it's interesting how um, this love, we already heard earlier that how do people know that we're his disciples? Because of our love one for another. It's interesting that Paul uh, in Philippians 1.9, as he's praying for the Philippian believers, and I would say as I look at the New Testament assemblies, probably the most loving assembly that Paul encountered in his experience was the assembly at Philippi. And yet he prays that about them that their love would abound yet more and more. Isn't that amazing? And so we should be praying for that. We should be praying for our assemblies. Yeah, they, they, they need to be places where the truth is preached. And we, we, want, we don't want to in any way minimize truth, but we also need to be praying that our assemblies will be places of abounding love. Where we really would love one another with pure hearts, fervently. And, and sometimes that's the message people get first. Before they even listen to our truth ministry, they'll be taken back by, wow, these people really love one another. It really leaves a deep impression. And so, uh, again, how, we can't produce that ourselves. Uh, by nature, we are self-centered. So it has to be dependent on the Spirit of God to produce that love in our lives. It's not natural to us. What's natural is to be self-centered, to be me-centered. It all revolves around me. What can I get out of this rather than what can I give? How can I somehow demonstrate something of the love of Christ to these uh, dear saints, and also to, to beyond that. Now start with the household of God, but go beyond that. How do we show that kind of love? And so again, he, he talks about this. Uh, again, it's not manufactured in any way uh, by uh, human effort, but it is the dependence on the Spirit of God produces love. He's the one that shed the love of God in our hearts in the first place. It's through the Holy Spirit, and He is the one that can manifest that through the life. And so we, we really desire that. And then joy, it's a kind of interesting. Uh, I'm, I'm thinking particularly in the context of, of Galatians. It's interesting that the most joyless people that you'll ever meet are legalists. And you see it in Scripture, don't you? Uh, it, it, who's the most miserable guy in the story of the prodigal son? The, other son, the, other son. the older brother, isn't it? Like he, he, can't, he can't enter into the joy of this restoration. Why? Because he's legalistic. And he's always thinking about all that I have done. <laughs> and nobody did anything for me, right? And, and, and so in John chapter 5, a marvelous, marvelous miracle. A man for 38 years being laying on a mat. And the Lord tells him, take up your bed and walk. And, and so the Pharisees see this and they don't say, oh, wow. Let's rejoice with our, our fellow Israelite who's suffered for so many years and now he can walk. All they can say is the Sabbath day. It's not lawful for you to carry your bed. And then it see, see that legalistic spirit is joyless. It really is. And we, joy is a beautiful thing. It smiles in the face of even the most adverse circumstances. One person said this, Joy is the happiness of heaven imported by the Spirit of God into the human heart. That's beautiful, isn't it? The happiness of heaven imported by the Spirit of God into a receptive <coughs> human heart. And again, we, we, we want to be joyful. Right, I, I, I said this often, but my, my, my one thing that I don't want as I get older is to become a grumpy old man. Grumpa? Yeah, grumpa. <laughs> a curmudgeon, that's the word. I love that word. It's just, don't you just love how it sounds, curmudgeon? But that's, what, that's a grumpy old man. Lord, deliver us from becoming grumpy old men. Pray that, we, that all of us will grow sweeter as the years go by, and we'll have that just that deep abiding joy, whatever our circumstances. 
And it's amazing, some of the most joyful people I've met have had some of the most adverse circumstances. There used to be a family at, at, at Greenwood Hills, and they lived on the grounds, and they had a, a, a very severely disabled son. And, and uh, the, the way they cared for this boy and all this kind of stuff. And, and actually, when, when he finally, I mean, he's quite elderly when he passed away. And they just wept like babies. And I remember going there and they'd say afterwards, oh, Mike, that was a great message. And all I could say to them is, your life is the greatest message I've ever seen on this campground. The joy that just oozed out of them in the midst of great difficulty. <clears throat> That's not natural. That's supernatural. That's the Spirit of God producing that kind of joy in the midst of difficulty. And that's available for us too. We can know that joy, even in the midst of great difficulties. And then peace. Peace. The Lord wants us to have peace, right? It's His gift to us. My peace I give you. Not as the world gives. And even in these troublesome days, it's, it's, it's amazing how as we walk in dependence on the Spirit of God, no matter what's going on in our country, as it implodes around us, we can still enjoy peace. Right? Thou will keep him in perfect peace, whose mind is stayed on thee. Trust ye in the Lord Jehovah, in the Lord Jehovah, there's everlasting strength. And, and oh, how wonderful to have that peace that the Spirit of God produces uh, in our lives. And, and then long-suffering. Uh, interesting word, macrothumia. A compound word of macros, which is long, and thumus, which, which is temper. We've already talked about these outbursts of wrath uh, in the flesh. And, and this idea of, uh, of, of um, long-suffering is just the opposite. It, it's, it's somebody who doesn't fly off the handle, doesn't you know, just kind of burst out, but but under even under provocation, under provocation, as this long suffering. And what does the First Corinthians thirty say? Love is patient, right? And, and it's interesting because one of the things that that I, I look back over my own life, and even in context of assembly life, a lot of times. I've experienced trouble in my life because of a lack of patience in the assembly. How come they can't get this? I mean, this is so obvious. It's black and white. Come on, get with the program, guys. <laughs> and I forget that it took me sometimes maybe eight years to get some of these truths clear in my own mind, but I want them to get it as soon as I speak it. And I'm learning <laughs> patience. And I'm beginning to see the fruit of patience, even in our assembly, right? Just, it takes time for things to happen. And, and prayer, and, and consistency, and, and just waiting on God prayerfully, and you begin to see things happen. <clears throat> and of course, manifesting love the whole time. We need that, don't we? How patient were we with one another during the COVID hiccups. Not very, some of us, right? So these are things we, we desperately need in our circles, in our assemblies. Uh, this long suffering, suffering long. And of course, love suffers long and is kind. <laughs> Not only puts up with difficulty, but shows kindness. Even to the people that have tested you. And we, we found that an interesting thing. I, I've told this story many times, but it was so liberating. I, I almost feel like I want to tell it everywhere I go. But my wife and I, um, we, uh, I was reading in Job, and, and just the simple scripture that the Lord re, uh, turned the captivity of Job when he prayed for his friends. It's one thing to read that and say, well, that's, that's, that's interesting. But then I began to think, like, I wouldn't have called those guys friends. I mean, they spent most of their time saying, Job, you're in this mess because you were a bad lad. Right? <laughs> you didn't do this and you didn't do that. And so, and then I thought, well, are there any friends in my life that I should be praying for? 
people that have hurt me deeply, people that have just been a thorn in our sides over the years, and we've had a few. Yeah, you're in the Lord's work, it's going to happen, right? I mean, the Christians, because we work close together, there's friction sometimes. And so, so we, my wife and I crafted a list of every person that we could think of that had ever hurt us, and then we spent the rest of the day praying for God's blessing upon those people. Now, I don't know whether it did anything for them. I, I have no idea. But I want to tell you, it set us free. It was absolutely liberating. And so every time we think of those people now, we don't fee think negative thoughts about them. We, we pray for them again. And it's, a, it's amazing. Simple things. <clears throat> and so, this idea of uh, suffering long, long suffering, um, and um, just think again about the Lord, how long suffering he has been with us. How long suffering he's been with the world. Right? Uh, why is the Lord not back yet? <laughs> well, he's long suffering, not willing that any should perish. It means amazing. Men curse him to his face. He doesn't zap them. He's long suffering. It's amazing, isn't it? How long suffering the Lord is. And we need to be like that. And again, the energy of the flesh can't produce this. It might be able to forgive maybe even seven times, but not 70 times seven. Flesh can't do that at all. It's impossible. It needs the Spirit of God, His divine energy, to produce that kind of response in our lives. And I guess what I'm saying to us is, folks, it's impossible to live the Christian life in your own strength. This is a dependent life for our eternal salvation. We had to depend entirely on the work that someone else did for us on Calvary's cross. Right? To live the Christian life, we have to depend moment by moment on someone else to manifest Christ's life through us. We can't produce that ourselves. And even when it comes to the rapture, even if I lose 50 pounds, it won't get me off the ground. Unless the Lord does it, I'm not moving anywhere, right? It, we're, we're dependent on Him from start to finish, from justification through to glorification. It's entirely a life lived in dependence on Him. And, and so, <clears throat> gentleness. And um, that's tough for some of us because some of us, you know, we're saved, we're kind of diamonds in the rough. And gentleness is not natural to us. It's not even part of the culture where I grew up. It wasn't, it wasn't known for gentleness. We, we called the spade a spade. We were, it, was a, it was kind of a rough, working-class environment. And people were just in your face. That's the way it was. Gentleness wasn't part of our psyche. And for some, that's difficult. Well, unless you produce that gentleness not going to be produced. And we need to be gentle. Because the Lord is very gentle with us. <clears throat> and, and, and we can look back over our lives and say, Lord, thank you for being so gentle in the way you've dealt with us. And it really comes back to this, doesn't it? Just think about what the Lord, how the Lord has dealt with you. It's so amazing when you think of how he's dealt with every one of us. <clears throat> and so the gentleness... Goodness. <laughs> Lord Jesus, again, we said this is a composite picture of Christ-likeness. And when it speaks of the Lord Jesus, it says he went about doing good. I love uh, Wesley, he, he came up with this, and I can't remember it all, but he says something like this, do all the good you can to all the people you can in all the ways you can, as long as you can. And there's probably more to it than that. But it was a tremendous statement that we should be people that are known for doing good. <clears throat> Show us, Lord, how can we do good for people's lives? How, how can we do that? This is, this is what the Lord would have us to do. This is what the Lord Jesus did. He went about doing good. How can we do that? Lord, show us. Show us practical ways on a daily basis where we can show something of your goodness in our conduct towards others.
And then faith, or other translations have the idea of faithfulness, uh, the idea of trustworthiness, and um, <clears throat> because the, the, the fruit of the Spirit are all moral qualities. And again, am I trustworthy? Am I a dependable person? Um, can the people in my assembly depend on me? Am I a dependable individual? Trustworthy? Can they, they do that? And again, we should be that way. That should be the quality that the Spirit produces in our lives. And then he talks about, um, <clears throat> after uh, referring to trustworthiness, he says meekness. I was um, preaching at Turkey Hill. It's kind of a, a it's, it's the camp near us, but it's a, it's, it's a ranch, and they actually do have horses and, uh, you know, kind of, uh, I, I think there's like five or six hundred acres. It's a huge camp. It's amazing. But um, there was a guy there, uh, interesting fellow. He, uh, he, was a, he was a wrangler, cowboy. Uh, he broke horses and he used it to preach the gospel. And so he would go around and he would bring in wild mustangs and he would, he would catch them and, and break them. And he did, I don't know how he did it. But, but anyway, he told me, he said, we have a name that we use when the horse is broken. We say it's meat. M-E-E-K-E-D. It's meat. I thought, wow, that's very enlightening, isn't it? Because meekness is strength under control. Right? And there's a tendency for some of us to get on our high horses a little bit. Easily offended, soon touchy. There's a lot of soon touchy brethren around, aren't there? And we can be like that and just kind of fire up. And, and meekness is, is strength. And we may even be right. That's the point. We might even be right, but it's bringing that under control because we can't do it. All. The Lord has to do that. It's strength under control. And of course, we think of the Lord Jesus come unto me, all you that are heavy laden. What do you say? For I am meek and lowly. You talk about strength under control. We've been talking about the Gospels. All the things that these people accused him of, all he had to do was speak, and they would be vaporized in an instance. Right? Because he's talk about strength. He spoke the world into existence. He holds it together by the word of his mouth. He has all strength. Even when they came to arrest him, isn't it? A, what an act of meekness that he actually allowed puny men to take him and bind him. We already saw. He just said, I am, and they all fell down. <laughs> all he had to do was just keep saying, I am, and they, they could never get up. <laughs> what? Strength under control. And so that meekness should be seen in our life. Temperance, self-control. That's a challenge. In an <coughs> indulgent society, Morningstar Bible Camp is probably not helpful. <laughs> Especially the kitchen. And that bowl over there. Right? <laughs> With all them goodies in. Right? Self-control. Through the Spirit. Self-control. And then he says this, and I love this statement, against such there is no law. You see, if the Spirit of God is in control of our lives, God will never condemn the fruit of his own Spirit. There's no law against that. Anywhere. I remember when we were in New Tribes Mission in their training program, um, we went to what was called boot camp in Wisconsin. That was our first time in the States, and um, they, it was a year's training, and at the end of that year, they assessed you based on uh, kind of certain criteria, whether you were, you were fit for the mission field with new tribes. I'm not saying you couldn't go with somebody else, but whether they would accept you as candidates, as missionaries. And so when we arrived in, they were just doing the interviews with the ones who had finished the program, and they were very hospitable. Uh, we just arrived, some of them would have us around for meals. And it seemed like every family just seemed really lovely people. And it seemed like the whole top floor, who had been so nice to us, was let go. You're not fit to be missionaries. And I remember thinking, how do you ever get out of this place? Like, these guys seem nicer than me, and they're all being, 
you know, they're being told, we, we don't want you. And I thought, how on earth does anybody get out of this place? And the natural thing to think about is, I've got to be a man pleaser. Right? They're watching us. So I've got to... And then I realized, no, that doesn't work. And that thought came to me, if I walk in dependence on the Holy Spirit, and the fruit of the Spirit is evidence in my life, there's no law anywhere against that. All I've got to do is concentrate on walking in dependence on Him. Yeah, yeah, they let us go. Amazing, but they did. But again, it was, it was liberating to just think, all I have to do is moment by moment depend on the Spirit of God. There's no law against that. And it says, they that are Christ, by the way, have crucified the flesh with the affections and lusts. So here we go again to this idea of crucifixion. The Lord loves that idea of crucifixion. He uses it frequently. And he talks about the fact that, um, well, when you got saved, uh, not only did Christ die for you, but you died with Christ. Your old man, what you were in Adam, <clears throat> was was nailed to the cross. Praise God for that. That's Romans 6. Galatians 2.20. Paul says, I'm crucified with Christ, nevertheless I live. The life I now live, I live by faith in the Son of God who mm -hmm. gave himself for me. So this idea of the crucified life, but there's a little bit of difference here. Apparently, I'm not a Greek expert, uh, but it says, um, the, the Romans 6, Galatians 2, the verb is in the passive voice, and the idea is was crucified or have been crucified. The reference is to what has been done for the believer as a result of Christ's death. It's something that's happened to us. Now, of course, Romans 6 says we have to reckon on that to be true, right? It happened, but we have to reckon on it to be true. But in this verse, <clears throat> it's, um, it's the active voice and it points rather to what the believer has himself done and must continue to regard as being done. And the idea is this. <clears throat> we talked about these men. Remember we put Christ is on the throne of his life. And then we put the I on the cross. And so what he's saying is this, that you see, because I've got the flesh is still there. <clears throat> Excuse me. The flesh is still there. But I have the Holy Spirit as well. And so how is the Holy Spirit going to be completely in control of my life when the flesh is still there, urging me to satisfy its demand? And so he says, they that are Christ have crucified the flesh with the affections and lusts. What we're doing is we're saying we reckon it dead. Right? That's the Romans 6. Reckon on it to be true. <clears throat> God has no plans to <clears throat> improve the flesh. His answer to the flesh is crucifixion. And so then, we live now in the Spirit. And so he says in verse 25, if we live in the Spirit, let's also walk in the Spirit. And then I think particularly in relation to the assembly there, he says, let us not be desirous of vain glory. You see this idea of these false teachers coming in and, you know, kind of, again, it's externalism, it's empty glory. Well, I got circumcised. I, I keep the law. I keep this. It's all empty glory. Let's, don't get involved in that kind of stuff. <clears throat> Provoking one another. Look at me. I'm so special. Envying one another. No, we, we don't want to be done with all that stuff. And so he's encouraging us in these things. Now, I, I, I didn't have a chance here. I've got five more minutes. Let me just um, say this in closing. I wanted to go to Hebrews and talk about this idea of <clears throat> all sin is based on unbelief. Romans, uh, sorry, Hebrews 12, it, it talks about the sin which does so easily beset us. And it's interesting how the sin is singular. It doesn't say the sins which does do so easily. There's one particular sin in mind in Hebrews chapter 12. And that sin is unbelief. But I think all sin. Garden of Eden. What, what happened in the Garden of Eden? What was the real issue? Disobedience. 
Well, what, why did they disobey? They didn't, they, didn't they didn't believe God, right? So God says, the day you eat thereof, thou shalt surely die. And along comes the serpent and says, you won't die. So what did they do? They believed the serpent rather than God. So it was unbelief. And, and all sin is based on unbelief. Like if, I, if I'm involved in something... Uh, and, you know, I'm doing it secretly, I'm doing it in private, you know, uh, incognito, all this kind of stuff. Guess what? I don't believe that God is watching, but he is. I don't believe God. That's amazing, isn't it? It's unbelief on my part. And so it's all based on unbelief. And again, I just want to say this closing thing, and I think it's really important. I, I've been thinking, you know, during the pandemic, um, they... Um, there was a big uh, emphasis on taking vitamin D3, right? Large doses of vitamin D3. Let me say this. I believe if you're going to have a successful Christian life, you have to have large doses of vitamin D3. Warren was looking at me, I think I've lost my mind altogether. <laughs> I'm going to tell you what the D3 is, the Christian life. We've already talked about one. The Christian life from start to finish is a dependent life. You can't live it yourself. It's impossible. You have to walk daily independent on the indwelling heavenly guest. But not only is it a dependent life, it's a devotional life. <clears throat> And what I mean by that is, it's a love relationship with a living person, right? So even the desire to do his commandments is because, well, if you love me, you'll keep my commandments. So the more I fall in love with this blessed person, the more I want to please him and do what he asked me to do. And so it's a dependent life. It's a devoted life. And the last D is, it's a disciplined life. 1 Timothy 4, 8, exercise yourself rather unto godliness. Never drift into a life of godliness. So there's a discipline. Prayer is a daily discipline. Reading the scriptures is a discipline. Faithfulness to assembly gatherings is a discipline. And, and anybody who's not disciplined never really seems to make much progress in the Christian life. So if you want to live a successful Christian life, just remind yourself every day, large doses of D3. Dependence, devotion, discipline. Let's pray. <clears throat> Our Father, we...